I've been speaking about the, uh, the voice of the ministry of the Spirit. I want to talk about a voice of warning this morning. So don't say I didn't warn you. All right. And if you feel like I'm pointing the finger at you, I am. I used to be very discreet about it, but now I'm just open. I just do it openly. You know, one way, Jesus. I've heard all the jokes. I'm the butt of all these jokes, but that's all right. That's all right. I'll get my own back eventually. That's it. Vengeance is of the Lord. He will repay. Okay, I want you to turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. Luke chapter 3, and we'll read verses 2 through 8. What did I say? Luke chapter 3? Yeah, I'm actually turning there myself. That's useful. Okay. Um, it says that Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, the crooked shall be made straight, the rough way shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which brings forth or brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that this is your voice to us. This is what you inspired to be written down, that we might understand your will, that we might understand your way, that we might know what it is that you'd say to our hearts. That, Lord, we might be challenged, that we might be changed, that we might follow in the way of righteousness and walk in the word of truth. So we pray again today, Lord, that as we ponder the scripture, as we ponder this passage, as we think upon what it is, what is your message to us, that in the challenge of our hearts, we would indeed be changed that, Lord, we would go away different, having met with you and having, having heard your voice again today, we pray. So we ask for the blessed anointing and quickening of your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, as we've considered in our previous studies, John, is the, he was the messenger or the voice of God in his generation. God sent him as the forerunner to Christ, to prepare the ground, to prepare the hearts of the people, to get them ready to receive Jesus Christ as the king of the kingdom. And Jesus is no ordinary man. He is the king of the kingdom. God prepares our hearts to receive him, and he makes that preparation through the work of repentance and the remission of sins. So we noted that John came preaching a baptism of repentance, a baptism or a washing away of sin and a receiving of uh, Christ to be their king. We also consider in the text that we find that John, John was a voice, um, not only in the text do we find that John is a voice calling people to repentance, 
But what we want to consider in this session is that John was also a voice calling the, or warning the people to flee from the wrath to come. So I want you to notice this in Luke 3.7. He, sa- he then, he says, so he, he, he shares the, uh, the essence of his message or the, or the heart of his ministry, what he'd received from the book of Isaiah. Um, he, he, he relates this to the multitude, to the people. And then all these people are gathered. They, they, they're coming to the River Jordan. They're coming to be baptized of him. There's this great multitude there to be baptized. And he, and he turns to them and he says, O generation of vipers. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So I want to talk about the importance of the statement uh, in the context of the, uh, of the text in John's ministry. So I just want you to notice, first of all, this, this illustration or description he uses of those that he's speaking to. He calls them a generation of vipers. So we're told that John makes a statement in the context of a great multitude of people that are gathered to be baptized of him. How many think this would be a great way to start a revival among people? You got, I mean, imagine we had half of Mochueka turns up and we said to them, you generation of vipers. How many people think that we probably hadn't missed the memo about how to win friends and influence people? You've been thinking, hey, John, have you lost your mind? You know, we've been working way here for years. We, we were just hoping that a whole multitude would turn up and you go now and say this. So you just, you just ruined our revival. So he calls them, he, get, he, he challenges them in two ways. Number one, he calls, them a vi- he calls them a generation of vipers. Now, yeah, I'm sure that, um, I'm sure he got his attention pretty quick. When he said this, particularly when you consider the audience that he's talking to. He wasn't talking to Gentiles. He wasn't talking to New Zealanders. He wasn't talking to Australians. He was talking to Jews. His audience were Jewish. The seed of Abraham by natural birth. And I love this about John the Baptist, and in lots of ways he reminds me of Winston Peters. <laughs> because only Winston Peters could say the things that he does about marry separatism and marry wokeism and get away with it. <laughs> and the only reason he can say it is because he's Maori. And if I said the same things, I'd be lynched. There'd be a lynch mob would turn up. You wouldn't lynch me, would you, John? Oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Why is it that Winston Peters can call out the radical and dangerous nonsense of Maori separatism? It's because he's Maori. And, because, and by saying such things as a Maori means he, what he says gets heard. He gets heard. Rather than being silenced. If the same things were raised by non-Maori, these comments would be silenced. Or an argument would be that this is simply an attempt to perpetuate a colonist worldview that seeks to oppress Mary and advance itself. No, I agree with Winston Peters. What we need is a united country. What we need is Maori and Pākehā working together. We don't need separatism. We don't need division. We need to work together. We need to support one another. We need to um, understand that a united country is best for everybody. It's best for Maori and it's best for Pākehā. It's best for whatever nationality, whatever people group we're from, that's what's best for us, not to um, separate everybody in the ethnic groups. In fact, what we actually see unfolding in our country is what's happening around the world, which is the, the fruit or the outworking of critical race theory, which is actually where, we, where races are pitted against one another, or races are made victims. Or minority groups are create, or we create minority um, race victim groups, and then we pit them against others, and it creates a majority race which is seen as the oppressors. Now, of course, if we can find how, if we can help find ways for Maori to thrive in New Zealand as a part of collective society, then we should do that. But we should do the same for all New Zealanders. 
It's starting to sound like a political speech, isn't it? <laughs> but I love Winston. He's a great guy. Long live Winston Peters. I just hope he finds his way into heaven. He is. Thank you for that. I knew it. All right. Okay, well, me and you, Bill, we'll get together and pray for him afterwards. Um, but here's a similarity with the ministry of John the Baptist. The thing I, f- I love about John the Baptist is that John the Baptist was a Jew. He was born of the Jewish nation. His tribe of origin was the tribe of Levi. He was of the priestly line. He was a very pious man. He loved God. He had a deep relationship with the Lord. He had a profound understanding of the scriptures. He would have been brought up in the Jewish system. He was immersed in the culture and the habits, the religious understanding of his days. He knew the history of the Jews and he was conversant with the political circumstances of his times. And then one day, seemingly out of nowhere, John the Baptist turns up out of the wilderness and starts preaching a baptism of repentance, calling people to get ready for the, for the Messiah. And this loud crowd of Jews, this large crowd of Jews turns up and he says something to them that only a Jew could say. He calls them a generation of vipers. If I was to say that today, I'd be called, I could be called anti-Semitic. You see the comparison. See, sometimes we're going to make a people group more important than another people group or somehow elevate them in the purposes of God. Actually, all people are the same across the world. That's not to say that God hasn't had a purpose in the Jewish people. Yes, he has. That's true. And he still has a purpose relative to them, but the the purpose in every um, group throughout the world is to bring them to Christ. And if we don't challenge the underlying reality of what stops a person from coming to Christ, then we won't bring them to Christ. So John says to them, you generation of vipers. Now this wouldn't have been lost on the Jews. He would have had their attention at that point. He was basically calling them a generation of serpents or snakes. Now what did John mean by this? I want you to come to a comparison in John 8, 41 to 44. Now, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus was also born as a Jew, part of the Jewish nation. So this is Jesus in John 8, verse 41. This is Jesus speaking to his own national ethnic group. He says to them, you do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we be not born of fornication. They're having a, they're having a swipe at his... Um, at the virgin birth, the incarnation. They say, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came of myself, but he sent me. Why don't you understand my speech, even because you can't hear my word? You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. What did Jesus just say to them? He's speaking to his own national ethnic group. What did he say to them? He said that they are of their father the devil. In other words, they're serpents. They, they identify with the serpent nature. Now, Jesus knew that they were of the seed of Abraham, but he doesn't, ad- he doesn't identify them with, their natural, uh, with the natural seed of Abraham. He identifies them with their spiritual origin by birth. He identifies exactly the same characteristics of unbelieving Jews that John does. He sees that they are a generation of vipers. Now, in case we weren't sure about this, just come back to Luke 3, verse 7 and 8, because John qualifies this statement. John 3, verse 7. 
uh, sorry, Luke 3, verse 7 and 8. Luke 3, 7 and 8. So John says to them, he said to the multitude, O you generation of vipers, who's, flee, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come, he says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. How many are glad that we're the living stones or the lively stones? Amen. Being chosen one by one to build the church, which is made up of both Jews and Gentiles, people from every ethnic group and nation across the world. So John says to them, don't you begin to say within yourself, hey, we've got Abraham to our father. We can trust to our natural origin. Don't you know who we are? We're the descendants. John, we're the descendants from Abraham. That, makes us el- that gives us eligibility. That somehow, give, that, that somehow rubber stamps us and gets us into heaven. John the Baptist is saying, don't go back to your original origin or, or the stock of your pedigree Don't believe because you were born of the natural seed of Abraham that somehow that makes you different to everybody else. The reality is we all came into the world the same way and we've all got the same issue going on. The fundamental problem of all of humanity is that we were conceived in iniquity and born in sin. And that makes all of us, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, of the seed of the serpent. That's our spiritual origin. That's our spiritual DNA. That's what we're born with. That's why it says that children go astray from the womb, speaking lies. That's why it says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, all have sinned and fallen short of God's intended purpose for us. doesn't matter what people group we are. And people would do well to, to take note of this today before they elevate the Jewish people or any people group above anybody else we all got we've all got the same fundamental problem going on so john calls them a generation of servants to bring this to their attention now the second thing he says to them is in relation to this in relation to this problem he says a generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So now we've got a second problem going on. Not only are they serpents, not only do they do they identify with the serpent, with the serpent nature, the sin nature, but there's a problem associated with identifying with the sin nature. And that is that the sin nature will ultimately incur the wrath of God. That's why he says to the most generation of vipers, who has warned you? to flee from the wrath to come. This is why John was calling them to repentance. Because just them relying upon their natural origin or their deriving their lineage from Abraham would not rescue them from the wrath of God. Because we're all born in sin, conceived in iniquity. So what they had was in common is the same thing that is in common with all of us. We all need the work of regeneration to be saved. And what I find interesting about this whole picture is that John comes preaching this baptism of repentance. And he gets this large crowd. I mean, there could have been thousands of people, multitudes. I mean, there were multitudes following Christ in his day, thousands of people coming out. You can imagine being at the River Jordan. There were thousands of people there. And they're all coming for this baptism that John is offering, this baptism of repentance, this baptism to, 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 um, to, to be washed away your sins and get right with God. And you'd be thinking at that point, wow, we're really onto something here. This is a great revival. There's, a, there's an amazing move going on here. All these people, they just want to get right with God. And in the midst of all that, John turns to them and says, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Oh, you generation of vipers, who's warned you? In other words, why have you come out to this baptism? Why have you come to this place? Why have you come out to to respond to my message? 
what motivated you to come and want to identify with the message that I'm preaching? And see, there's lots of different reasons why people come and listen to the Word of God. There's lots of different reasons why people come to revivals or meetings or experiences. There's lots of different reasons why people turn up at that point in time. They might be motivated by, their, by a friend. They might have been uh, encouraged by somebody else to be there. They might respond because they, they, they have an emotional response. They might have a, a, you know, different reasons. They might think life's going to be better. It's all going to be different. But John challenges the fundamental reason that these people needed to understand why they were there. The fundamental reason was, the question that he was asking them was, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And it's a good question to ask ourselves is, what is it that actually motivates us in responding to God? The reason why this is a good challenge, I want you to come to Matthew 3, verse 18 to 21, because people respond to God for different reasons, but we need to, know, we need to understand why we're responding to Him. I want you to come to Matthew 13, 18 to 21. Matthew 13, yeah, I think I said Matthew 3. So Matthew 13, verse 18 to 21, this is part of the parable of the sower. He says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands not, then comes the wicked one, catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that receives seed into the stony place is the same as he that hears the word and anon with joy receives it, yet he has not root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. Receives the word with joy. Really happy about hearing the gospel and this gospel message, the message of the kingdom, how I can be saved, all those things. Responds with joy, but only goes on for a while because when things begin to get tough or tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, they fall away. In other words, the word hadn't really taken root in their heart. They probably possibly hadn't comprehended the cost. They hadn't recognized what it really means to give your life to Jesus Christ or why they are doing this. God is not looking just for an emotional response. God is looking for a response that understands, that comprehends why we need to get right with God. Why we need to get right with Him. It's not just because we're pressured to make a decision or we have an emotional response, we need a genuine conversion to Christ. And I think John nails it when he, he, mo- he asks the crowd about what motivating them. He wants to know why they have come. Now, of course, we can be motivated by the concept of the love of God. How many people have a comprehension of the love of God? The love of God. How many people have a comprehension of the love of God? God loves us, amen? His amazing grace. Let's go to John 3.16. So well known. Oft-quoted verse of Scripture. But sometimes we don't actually think about the, the, the whole verse or what it means. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And that's wonderful. We can dwell on the love of God. God so loved us that he sent his Son to die on the cross for us. We, we, you know, that, that's an amazing uh, picture of the grace of God. But it says that God gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes on him should not perish, 
That's the other part of the equation. There's a reason why God gave his son on the cross. And the reason why God gave his son on the cross is that we would not perish. In other words, not perish but have everlasting life. What that suggests is that there are two possible outcomes when we leave this life. Either everlasting life or perishing. What does that mean? You see, the reality is being saved only makes sense if we understand what it is that we are saved from. That's why it makes sense. The whole salvation message only means something to us if we understand that there is something to be saved from. This is the message of John the Baptist. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That is, when we are saved, we are saved from the wrath of God. We're saved from the inevitable outcome of what sin will bring upon those who reject God's offer of salvation. Now, as we consider this, I want to briefly explore the idea of wrath or anger as a legitimate expression of God. So, if I give a brief definition of anger, anger is the feeling or emotion that arises in response to wrongdoing, some kind of injustice, pain, or by cause of provocation. Anger is not a bad emotion. In fact, uh, it is in fact a righteous emotion and something that will naturally rise within us in response to wrongs or injustice. However, the problem for us is not the emotion of anger, but rather when anger gets out of control or we become unjustifiably angry. This is when the emotion of anger can lead to bad results. How many people have had bad results from the wrong emotion of anger? Why isn't everybody's hand up? Am I the only person who's ever felt that? Come on now, let's be honest. You see, often our own experiences with anger have not always been positive. And because of this, people often find it hard to reconcile the emotion of anger with God. A distorted view of anger may lead people to the opinion that God would never be angry. I mean, how could God be angry if God is love? But the fact is that God does does experience anger. He has a sense of anger, but it is never out of control. God is never out of control. So I want to talk a little bit then about why God might be angry. As we do this, let me draw on the draw on the illustration of human experience. How many people have children? I can already tell you know what I'm talking about. What raises the ire of parents? Disobedience. <laughs> Disobedient children. Children who are going against your will or what you know is right or best for them. It has the capacity to um, raise, what's that? Raise the blood pressure. Thank you for that, Heather. So don't see a doctor. Just get some anger management. This is the problem of self-will or disobedience. And in the same way that we might feel aggrieved by, the act, by these actions, God is aggrieved by the actions of sinful people who walk contrary to his will. Uh, Psalm 7 verse 11 says that God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. God feels anger towards wicked behavior. Uh, let me give you some examples in Scripture. I'll just quote these two, you won't turn to them, but in 2 Chronicles 34, 21, they were said to go and inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. They transgressed God's commandments. They went their own way. They went against Him. They committed idolatry. 
They followed the, uh, the idolatrous practices of the land, which include, included human sacrifice, all forms of uh, sexual immorality, you name it, they were following these trends in the nation of Israel. No wonder God felt anger and wrath towards them. Um, in Deuteronomy 29, verses 23 to 24, God told the nation of Israel that if they transgressed his ways and turned to do evil, that they will experience his anger in the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah did. That was Deuteronomy 29, 23 to 24. There's something else important that we should understand about the anger of God, and that God is slow to anger. How many are glad about that? I'm really glad about that, amen? Really glad. Uh, how many have had a cat that is slow to anger? You know, you just just a little bit of provocation, then eventually it's like whack. You know, you you get it, you get clawed, or the dog. You know, a little bit of provocation goes on for a while, but then they've had enough. Yeah, it happened to me when I was young once. I got bitten on the nose by a dog. I was sitting at the table. I found out you don't mess with dogs. What's that? I probably shouldn't have had it sitting at the table. That was a good idea, Chrissy. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> but I was only a child. When I consider this, there is a ri- I believe there is a rising tide of God's anger and I must tremble for our generation. Why would God be angry with us? Do you think God would be angry with the fact that there are fo- over 46 million abortions that occur across the world annually? Or 46,000 every year in New Zealand. That's 46 million people being murdered every year in the name of women's rights. There's a lot of talk about women's rights, but there's very little talk about a child's right to protection. And it's to me, it's so grievous that that the place that should be the most nurtured, the most protected... Uh, the most intimate for a child is the place where they're most at risk. That to me is just, it's hard to fathom that, that, you know, that we could live in a world where that would be promoted as some kind of um, ideal for you know, a, a woman's rights concept. What about all the women who have died as a result of abortion? Did they have a right? Do they not have a right to life? We should do our utmost to protect our most vulnerable. And if we don't do our utmost to protect the most vulnerable in the womb, what's to say that in our time of vulnerability, we, wouldn't, we will be protected? We should do the utmost to protect our vulnerable senior citizens. We should protect people at every level of life. Do we think perhaps all the murders, rapes and thuggery perhaps every day goes unnoticed by God? Do we think perhaps the provocation of the gender rights, which is uh, the gender, right, gender rights movement, which is uh, distorting views of gender uh, ideology, uh, gender ideolo- ideology, that is in, in fact um, is really in fact a, a medical and social experiment on young people. These are things that shouldn't be happening. There is, of course, the worldwide trafficking, sexual exploitation of women and children through pornography, abuse, etc. The moral corruption of this world is reaching a critical moment. I believe we're dangerously close to reaching the point of God's anger where he will measure out his wrath. Every generation, it says, has a cup. Every generation fills up that cup. And that cup is being filled up in this generation. The world is on a collision course with the anger of God. Romans 1.18 says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The book of Revelation is a frightening commentary for those who reject him, revealing the most extreme events of an outpouring of wrath upon a world at the end of this age. And while these events may be alarming enough, it's just a pre- prelude to the ultimate expression of God's anger which will be the agonies of hell. G. 
Deuteronomy 32 verse 22 says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn to the lowest hell, shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. In Psalm 90 verse 11, the psalmist asks, Who knows the power of your anger? Even according to your fear, so is your wrath. I want you to come with me to Luke 12 verse 4 and 5. says, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. After that, they have no more they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him that after you have killed have power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. I'll tell you something now about the fear of God. We, we need a healthy dose of the fear of God in our lives. We need to understand that God is a God of love. He's a God of compassion. He's a God of mercy. He's done everything in his power to save us. He sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. He loves us beyond measure. There is absolutely no doubt about that. But he is a God to be feared. Feared in respect of the fact that he will, uh, he will measure out that which is deserving in the end for those that reject his grace and turn away from him or persist in a lifestyle of sin and disobedience and rebellion to him. And God will be just in doing that. How many people would like to live in eternity with all of the sin and iniquity that's going on? Would any of us like to live like that for all eternity? Well, God doesn't want to live like that, and he doesn't want a new heavens and a new earth where that exists. So he simply, he's, he's laid it out as it is. And it's not hard for us to understand that there, with the actions, there are consequences. There are consequences. We're living in a world where people want to diminish consequences. I want to say there's no consequences for our actions. Well, there are consequences for our actions. There is a final outcome. And I don't know about you, but I fear God. I fear Him. And on one hand, I love Him. I'm compelled to serve Him because of His love. But on the other hand, that is balanced with the reality that I fear Him because I know that if I deviate from his ways and I go my own way in rebellion against him, then I will suffer the consequences of my rebellion. And it's good to have those two things in our lives. Because how many know we don't, we're not always in love with God as much as we should be? But I'll tell you something, when we're not always in love with God as much as we should be, this is there to balance that out. And it, it brings you back quite quickly <laughs> to reality. That, hey, you know, sin might seem attractive sometimes. Might be difficult serving God. There might be some challenges along the way, but I'll tell you something now. I know where I want to spend eternity. How many people want to spend eternity in heaven with God? Amen? And, that, you know, and it's not set there to, to compel people to choose God because they fear hell. That's not what it's about. It's just simply, it's a counterbalance to the reality that if we go our own way, there is a consequence. There is a consequence. And we need to understand that. You know, we shouldn't water down the Bible or the gospel or the truth about God. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He's asking the question, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who's brought this to your attention? Who's helped you to understand what's coming down the line? Because don't come to Jesus Christ just because, oh, well, I'm going to get a better life. You may get a better life, but things might get more difficult. There might be more challenges around the corner. It might not always be easy to be a Christian. In fact, it's often not easy being a Christian and a believer, and it's probably getting more difficult in the world that we live in. We serve God and we love God because He deserves our love. Amen. He deserves the glory. He's our creator. He's a righteous, a holy, and a just God. He can only do good and what's right. And we're not in it, we're not in this for what's in it for ourselves. We're in it because He's created us 
to serve and to love and to walk with him. And that's the best kind of relationship any of us can have. And we do that to the best of our abilities. We can't persist in a lifestyle of sin and hope to escape the judgments of God. I want you to come to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Just pick it up in its context here. Verse, in verse 1 it says, You, he's quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's us, amen. He's made us to live. He's given us spiritual and eternal life. And we're born again. He said, we're in time past. So he's thinking uh, previous to the cross. You walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, that, that spirit that was influencing us and influencing the way that we behave, the way that we thought, the patterns of our life. Among whom also we all had our conversation and our lifestyle in times past and the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. See, these are the things that will bring the wrath of God upon people. I want you to come over to um, uh, chapter 5. Pick it up in verse 3, but fornication, so sexual immorality, living, out, living outside of the bonds of marriage, sexual immorality, uncleanness, covetousness, don't let it be once named among you as become saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking or jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you need to know, that no whoremonger, so sexually immoral, sexually unclean or impure, person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So when we live, when people live a sinful life, when people willfully persist in sin and live in an habitual lifestyle that is opposed to God and his ways, not because God is a killjoy, not because God, you know, has, is on a big power trip, but because God knows what is best for us. There's a reason why all of these, these uh, legitimate relationships and roles exist within the, within the government of God. You've only got to look at the, the, the whole concept of marriage itself to understand that there's a, there's a reason why marriage has been instituted is the way that it has because out of marriage comes children. Children need parents. They need a stable environment. You look at all of what's going on in the world where you take that, that away and you just make it a free-for-all. This is the big trouble that we've got going on. It leads to all of these other problems. See? God tells us what is right. So we can't carry on, we can't persist in this lifestyle and think that we'll somehow avoid the wrath of God. Fortunately for us, while God will and must measure out his righteous wrath against sinners, he has provided a means of salvation. I want you to come to Habakkuk 3 verse 2. Habakkuk 3 verse 2. It's a prayer of Habakkuk. 
He says, O Lord, I've heard, of your, I've heard your speech and was afraid. How many people fear before the Lord this morning? Amen. I fear the just judgments of God. And then his prayer is, Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. And see, that's the cross. At the cross, God measured out his wrath upon his son. In the midst of the years, in wrath, he has remembered mercy. Because God is a God of compassion and mercy. He has a deep, deep desire to save us and rescue us from this condition of sin. And though I'm talking about the wrath of God and I'm talking about his anger against sin, I'm talking about his righteous indignation and some of us think, goodness, that's, that's fearful. Well, in the midst of all that, there is a God of compassion, of love, of mercy, who deeply, deeply longs for us to abandon sin, to repent of our sin and turn to him and be saved. He wants to rescue us. He has no delight that anybody would perish. That's not his heart. But he will not compel us against our will. Psalm 85 Verse 2 says, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You've covered all of their sin. You've taken away all of your wrath. You've turned from the fierceness of your anger. And then it says in verse 4, turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Turn us. You see, we need God to turn us. That's, the, that's what the message of the gospel does. That's what the Spirit of God comes to do in a person's heart. It comes to turn us to him who can save us and cause his wrath to be turned away from us. Turn our hearts and we shall be turned, the psalmist says. Just finish in uh, John's Gospel. Oh, sorry, in Luke. Come back to our opening passage. Luke 3. Luke 3, verse 3. came into the country of Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance from sins. It's written in the book of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, the crooked shall be made straight, the rough way shall be made smooth. It can only happen as our hearts, as we repent and our hearts are turned. All flesh shall see the salvation of our God. Then he said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized, O generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now here's the answer. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Bring forth that which answers to a change of life. Respond to the gospel. Allow the grace of God to come into you and change you to walk in his will and to be transformed into his way. And what that simply means is that as we repent of our sins and we come to him, he transforms our life. And it, may not, it, it probably won't happen all at once, but it will happen little by little. A process of transformation. What is important is that we don't continue in an habitual lifestyle of sin. We don't persist in our old ways. We may struggle with our old ways. We may at times even fall back into them. We may at times uh, sin against God, but if we would cry out to him and call upon his grace, he can help us, amen, to walk in his way and to have a changed life and to continue in this journey of transformation to become like him. But the, the challenge for all of us is that we must leave the life that we were living and pursue the life 
that is answerable to a life of repentance, amen, and walking in his will. That truly reveals that we fear God and we recognize that there is a wrath to flee from, amen.